Yeah, I think this is a good a good number for to assume. Yeah. Set the size. Okay. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the workshop. Uh, this one is called Ever Upward, which is the New York State motto. Uh, you might know it from like Excelsior, which is what most people are using for like financial aid and stuff. But it's just interesting to look at like what does upward mean in terms of progress and industrialization, especially within like the context of environmental justice and the New York State area. Um, so yeah, if we just go around and everyone introduce themselves first, then we're going to get into the workshop. Oh, wait. You can say how you, uh, your name and how you heard about this. My name is Delia, and I found flyers. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So my, my name is Priska, and she showed me the flyer that she found. <laughs> uh, my name's Italia, and she forwarded me the flyer. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Ebony, and like, you came up to me and talked to me. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. My name is Nami, and I was talking to a frog. <laughs> no, Vera <laughs> And I'm Vera Scroggins from uh, Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm Palmer. It was posted in a group chat that I'm in. Okay, awesome. What group chat? Uh, Binghamton Progressives. Oh, dope. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my name's George uh, and Miss Anthony. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, as George so eloquently put it, I'm Anthony. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, well, we just organized it, so that's how we heard about it. <laughs> um, so the first, the first. We're gonna, so in this workshop, we're going to be talking about the relationship between people and place. Uh, and to start with, just to get our heads thinking about uh, places in a personal way, we like to do a short, a short writing exercise. So could we all take like three to five minutes uh, to write in our, in our notebooks or paper about a place that makes you who you are, like a place that has taught you something, a place that um, has enriched your life, and a place that you would fight to protect. Uh, so when you're done, uh, we're going to come into a group and we're going to Whoever wants to share could talk about their place kind of briefly. Uh, I know anyone needs pens, like I have some. Yeah. Also, <laughs> just, if you want, you can make. So I'm from Brooklyn, uh, and the, the first place would be Prospect Park. I grew up a couple blocks away from Prospect Park, and uh, it was kind of like a little like uh, haven inside like the city, and it's beautiful. It's like it's one of the largest urban woodlands in the U.S. Um, it was we're just doing an exercise. We're, gonna be we're talking about a place that made us who we are, so a place we're going from. Um, and uh, I spent all, like, all my childhood when I was in Brooklyn hanging out in Prospect Park with my, with my friends, and again, it made me appreciate nature even in like that kind of uh, managed form. Um, the other place is a very similar role in my life. My grandma's in Bermuda, and I spent all my summers as a kid uh, at her house there. Um, and like, and uh, specifically, like the most calm and the most like powerful I've ever felt uh, in that like calm way has been sitting at the edge of her dock, like really late at night. And I, I, that was like a thing that I would do the first night and the last night. Whenever I stayed, I would stay up all night and just sit at the dock and like look at the water. And and sometimes like miraculous things happen. Like I, I would see like families of um, uh, of like. Uh, rays like going by the dock and like the baby ones following the, the mama ray and stuff like that and, and really cool things you know like the fish jumping all that so those are the two places that, that that I would really fight to protect because I feel like they made me who I am <laughs> um, anyone else could start with your talk Every time I go back, like I just think about like my childhood and mm -hmm. probably fight to protect them. Mm -hmm. Um, I fight to protect this like creek that's near my house. And it kinda like leads into these woods. And like it was where I spent like my entire childhood, like with my brother and like my cousins from the city would always come. And it was kinda like their first first like exposure to like nature since they don't really have anything, they're from Queens, so we would like build forts, like these bridges, like it was like the things that like kind of taught me about like adventure and like nature and I would really fight to protect that place because it means a lot. Um, uh, I guess I'll go next. So the place that like came to my mind was that like in my elementary school, sometimes I still visit it and there was this greenhouse that they had 
and like I remember like some of my like best memories, my friends back then were just like, le- like we we were really lucky in that we had like a greenhouse to like, and we like learned about different like kind of kinds of plants and like how it's like like grow like I don't know like basil in like a little like pot like for like cooking and stuff and it was just like it's kind of just being I grew, I grew up in the city just for context I guess so like like people have been like saying that there was there was like only pockets of nature and that was just like one area where I got to like actually like experience like like gardening because I didn't have like a backyard or anything. Not everyone has to talk. Um... Yeah, before we move on, oh, yeah. I would say I would like to protect where I live now, Susquehanna County, and that's where I've been for almost 30 years and I moved there from the New York City area. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and then moved to Long Island, Nassau County. So I moved here and I'd like to protect the rural counties. There's about 20 counties in Pennsylvania that are being fracked. So I'd like to protect the environment there and where I live, because I wanted to specifically live the latter part of my life in a natural setting, in nature, with trees and animals and clean streams and clean air and clean water. And right now our whole system is being uh, impacted and assaulted by a toxic industry that's taken over. So let me add just one thing to what I said about I would um, fight to protect Binghamton University, but really Binghamton as a whole and the whole area. Mm -hmm. Um, IBM wanted to to cut down uh, 300 or so trees in the IBM Glen over near Endwell. And uh, because of a meeting at Binghamton University that was widely attended, and the um, Sierra Club was here, and many, many larger groups from around the nation gathered to meet and talk about how to stop IBM, and it worked. Yeah, that's a um, that's a really good point. That we're gonna like IBM as a concept artist. So it's something we're gonna get to within this con- this um, presentation. And also just the idea We're going to talk about IBM for a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also the idea of like, the fact that like, while these are like uh, mainly student power workshops, the idea of like Binghamton University is not just like isolated from Binghamton as a whole. That's yeah. right. And um, also just like, we like, for the presentation in general, we wanted to keep it like kind of like a discussion workshop type of feel. So if you ever have anything you want to say like on a slide, like don't feel like you have to like wait your turn, like just like raise your hand, or even if there's like a pause, just feel free to like, like put in your like thoughts or whatever. So, mm-hmm. so we started with this exercise because we're talking about environmental justice, uh, and I'm into talking about the relationship between people's and pl- people and place, um, and we just wanted to kind of get people thinking. We kind of the mindset that every single place, every single corner of this earth, has someone. Uh, like who would who, who would fight or is fighting to protect it? Um, has someone who that place m- means something to, uh, and that's kind of like the uh, mindset we want to be entering this workshop with. Okay. So the first we wrote this like entire presentation down. It's like chapters basically. So the first we're going to start off with like, the history and principles of environmental justice, specifically within the Binghamton area. So um, I feel like one thing that often like. A lot of people, especially like currently going to Binghamton University, like don't like aren't aware of is just that there is such like a rich history of like environmental activism and like organizing like locally like right, right where we are. So uh, one thing we wanted to start off with was um, this important case that occurred in the 1970s. So um, environmental justice is like tied into a lot of issues. It's not just like it's kind of like understanding that the environment isn't just like tied to the plants and things around us, but it's also um, it like it's intersectional, just like all things. So there's like it's impacted by like class, race, relations, and just everything. So um, one example of that is the placement of landfills, both like in Binghamton as an area and just almost uh, universally, uh, nationally across the U.S. So a lot of times they were placed uh, in low income and areas where there are a lot of people of color. And this one instance, the Warren County landfill, um, was one of the first instances where there was a large um, movement of organizing to protest the uh, kind of the creation of a new landfill near this neighborhood. So 
it was just an example of how like these citizens they weren't like they weren't like part of some official organization. They were just like members of their community who like wanted to protect where they grew up and where they what was where the area that was important to them. So they were able to organize and fight against it. Um, one important thing to note is that unfortunately they weren't successful in stopping it from being created, <laughs> which um, is like a fact of life. Like not every organizing attempt is gonna like be successful, but it's important to like still like um, use your voice. Just like so, even if you aren't successful, you at least fought for what you believed in. And it was kind of, so. This is the case. This is pretty much the first time the environmental justice term uh, became widely used, and um, at the time, Warren County had like the largest percentage of black residents, as well as the high, highest poverty rate in North Carolina. Um, at the same, uh, and the, uh, the, like adding on to those issues, they built this industrial landfill that caused all these health problems that are going to be talked about in the, in the video we're going to watch. But in two, three, after, in two, they actually have been successful for a long time. So in 2003, after decades of damage, the state started a program to remove uh, some of the PCBs uh, from the county. So that's, that's like a toxic chemical. So. Now, like in our county, you know, as far as um, environmental justice, it's one of the poorest counties in Pennsylvania, where I am in Susquehanna County. It might be like number four in poverty. So, but it's mostly white like 99%. Oh. So it's poor, but the, we have that element as far as that racial composition. And they, they took over very easily, so there's very little opposition. People are afraid to do anything, except for a handful. Yeah, I mean, that's just like, yeah, that like, it's an intersection of a lot of things. So while race is also a factor in certain areas, there's classes also, and class and like, Mm. Things like that are also like important factors to take into account, and like where environmental justice specifically like, comes into play. So this is just like yeah, like a short video like talking about the topic. Uh, we're going to watch an interview with uh, Bob Bob Bouillard. He was like a professor. He's a sociologist. He was one of the main activists fighting the fight in North Carolina at the time, uh, and he's one of the people who uh, defined at least academic in, in the academic world the idea of environmental justice. One hundred percent of all of Houston's city-owned landfills were located in predominantly black neighborhoods. One hundred percent, without deviation, six out of eight of the city-owned uh, incinerators were located in predominantly black neighborhoods. We will not allow Warren County to become a dump site. It was not until Warren County, where that toxic waste landfill was placed in the middle of this predominantly black county, that began to galvanize people to talk about this whole idea of environmental racism. The protesters were told not to block the trucks. They're now lying in the streets now, blocking one truck moving into the landfill. They were refusing in order to move, and they are being arrested one by one. This black community being dumped on, being targeted, and people saying no. We have a right to live in a clean and healthy environment. That's when the whole idea of environmental justice as a national movement uh, came into effect. The mainstream environmental movement uh, for too long did not realize how important this was and did not cooperate and partner with, with the environmental justice movement. And it took uh, two decades for those two movements, civil rights movement and environmental movement, to converge. Then we said, okay, environmental justice for all. It's about race and class. And if a community that is poor and it is powerless, if they're getting dumped on, then that is an environmental justice issue because it's about power or lack thereof. This is about human rights. Um, so you said, so two decades later, uh, the environmental justice movement had gained a lot more momentum, um, and uh, act and activists met in uh, D.C. and Washington uh, for the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, and they wrote the 17 principles of environmental justice, which we handed out in the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so just like so, what we're gonna do here, just to, like 
uh, we're gonna go around and like let each person like just say uh, one of them at a time, and then while uh, we're also gonna read the preamble just to mm -hmm. like it kind of explains their goal, and just while you're like while we're going around reading them, um, these are kind of like the questions to like keep in mind. So uh, at the end, if you wanna like raise your hand and like say like one principle that stood out to you or like just like that you feel like. That you just have like want to talk about, then like feel free. So I guess uh, I'll start with uh, number one. And um, and um, you could you just pass it this way after he he starts? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, but do you want to read the example? Um, yeah. So the, we, the people of color, gathered together at the multinational uh, people of color environmental leadership summit to begin to build a national and international movement of all peoples of color to fight the destruction and taking of our lands and communities. I do hereby reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of our Mother Earth, to respect and celebrate each of our cultures, languages, and beliefs about the natural world and our roles in healing ourselves, to ensure environmental justice, to promote economic alternatives which would con contribute to the development of environmentally safe li livelihoods, and to secure our p political, economic, and cultural liberation that has been denied for over 500 years of colonization and oppression, resulting in the poisoning of our communities and land and the genocide of our peoples to affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice. So Seth, could you start with the first one? And, uh, and then we'll go through all 17. Yeah. Um, one. Environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, eco ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species, and the right to be free from ecological destruction. Number two, uh, environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all people free from any and from any form of discrimination or violence. Number three, environmental justice mandates the right to ethical, balanced, and responsible uses of land and renewable resources in the interest of a sustainable planet for humans and other living things. Number four, environmental justice calls for universal protection from nuclear testing, extraction, production, and disposal of toxic or hazardous waste and poisons and nuclear testing that threaten the fundamental right to clean air, land, water, and food. Uh, number five, environmental justice affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination of all peoples. Number six, environmental justice demands the cessation of production of all toxins, hazardous wastes, and radioactive materials, and all that, and all past and current producers be held strictly accountable to the people for detoxification and the containment of at the point of production. Environmental justice number seven demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, including needs assessment, planning, Implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. Environmental justice affirms the right of all workers to a safe and healthy work environment without being forced to choose between an unsafe livelihood and unemployment. It also affirms the right of those who work at home to be free from environmental hazards. Um, Number 10. So uh, environmental justice protects the rights of victims of environmental injustice to receive full compensation and reparations for damages as well as quality health care. Okay. Um, environmental justice considers government so acts of environmental injustice a violation of international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the United Nations Convention on Genocide. Number 11. Um, must recognize a special legal and natural relationship of native, native peoples to the U.S. government through treaties, agreements, compacts, and covenants affirming sovereignty and self-determination. Number 12, environmental justice affirms the need for urban and rural economic, ecological policy to clean up and rebuild our cities and rural areas in balance with nature honoring the cultural integrity of all, of all our communities and provide fair um, access for all to the full range of our peoples. 
13, environmental justice calls for the strict enforcement of principles of informed consent and a halt to the testing of experiment, ex, experimental reproductive and medical procedures and vaccinations on people of color. Number 14, environmental justice opposes the destructive operations of multinational corporations. Um, number 15, environmental justice opposes military occupation, repression, and ex exploitation of lands, peoples, and cultures, and other life forms. Number 16, environmental justice calls for the education of present and future generations, which emphasizes social and environmental issues based on our experience and an appreciation of the diverse cultural perspectives. Hmm. Number 17, environmental justice requires that we as individuals make personal and consumer choices to consume as little of Mother Earth's resources and to produce as little waste as possible and make the conscious decision to challenge and reprioritize our lifestyles to ensure the health of the natural world for present and future generations. Okay. okay, so so either if you want to comment on the preamble or just like want to speak about one uh, point or uh, number that stood out to you, uh, you can feel free. Also, like another question to consider is like how does environmental justice differ from environmentalism? So if anyone would like to speak about one point or another. Uh, well, I'm amazed that there's 17 points here. I, I don't think I've heard of this yet, and I'm surprised that I haven't heard of it, and it's not, there's not um, more publicity about it, and this has happened since 1973. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a long time. It's like, sounds like, what, 50 years or something? Yeah. So this is, um, and I'm really appreciative of uh, the whole multinational people of color leadership that produced this. It's uh, really excellent. And I want to say, too, that our state of Pennsylvania does have an environmental, I would say, justice law that they implemented. We're one of the few states, and the law says something like all people are entitled to clean air and clean water, that it's an entitlement of some kind, and it should be protected. And despite that amendment, in our, it's actually in our Constitution, Pennsylvania Constitution, despite that amendment, we have now been grossly assaulted by toxic industries, not only with the coal industry, now with the oil and gas industry and all the fracking that's going on. So despite that, even though it's on the books, anything that's on the books needs to be enforced. So we don't have that. Yeah. Well, it all began with a big piece of energy legislation that got bundled into larger legislation even still. When G.W. Bush was president, the real president, Dick Cheney, pushed <clears throat> the energy legislation into this larger piece which said that nothing had to take place before fracking. In other words, no examination, assessment, yeah. evaluation, opened the floodgates. I think that's a big distinction, and that's a distinction that's made in these principles. It's the difference between distributive justice, saying people have the right to this thing, uh, and, say, and procedural justice, saying people have the right to make a decision about these things. Mm -hmm. um, and until communities have a say in the way these decisions are made, uh, no one's going to protect them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. I think I have a pretty good understanding of what environmental justice is, like how it intersects more with policy with, with race and classism and stuff like that. But I don't really get what environmentalism is, like where, like what that distinction is. Like is it more just um, like protests and people of activism and environmental justice is more due to legislation? Um, I guess maybe the difference between the, envir the environmental movement and the environmental just justice movement. Mm -hmm. Is maybe a, a clearer way to frame the question for you, like how does this depart from, and, and Bob Lee Younger talked about it in the video a little bit, but how does this depart from um, not only the, pre, the longer history of the environmental movement, but our understandings of what the environment is? How does it depart from um, the idea of, of environmentalism, not that this is not important, but environmentalism as protecting national parks 
is including environmentalism as trying to protect people too. Um, uh, I don't know. Does that, does that have anything to say? Yeah. Yeah, I guess like I like I don't know if it's, it's like clear, but it's like it's connected to what you said. Is like to me, environmentalism is more just like oh, specifically the environment. How do we like preserve that and <clears throat> help that? But then environmental justice is like mm -hmm. connection to people, how it affects the people, and um, yeah, have like the justice for everyone, mm -hmm. not just those who have access to the environment, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I was noticing. Uh, when you're reading off all those principles, is that I feel like they're both have to, they both relate to ethics, um, but with environmental justice, you also see equity within there. Um, I mean, I feel like multiple of those principles, you kept on seeing a common theme of uh, an organization uh, perhaps taking advantage of another group of individuals. Mm -hmm. So I feel like environmentalist is just strictly based off of support of the environment, whereas environmental justice, you know, incites that that emotion behind inequity and mm -hmm. it's it's unjust pretty much. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also thought a really good principle was the fact that they mentioned future generations and I feel like intergenerational justice isn't talked a lot about as like when it should be because the environment affects not just the people living in it now, it affects so many future generations. So you have to think really hard about what you do now and how it affects future generations and the way your politics like, Think about future generations when you're making policy for now, which I thought was a really cool point that they yeah. included. Thank you. The corporate uh, element is, needs to be emphasized because corporations today don't operate according to the same rules they used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, one of the great leaders and icons or um, icons of quality in America quality guru of America, Philip Crosby, defined uh, the purpose of a reason for a corporation, and it was, this was back in the 70s and 80s, that a corporation exists to help people have lives. Today corporations exist for money, and they destroy lives through their choices, and they do have choices they don't know they have choices. Mm -hmm. It's up to environmental activism or environmental people involved, involved in environmental justice to show them the way. Mm -hmm. Right, but they will insist, like the corporations in my county right now, the past 10 years, they are insisting that they're improving our quality of life, that they're here to improve our lives, to make everything easier for us, to make the environment even better, mm -hmm. and they deny any impacts negative impacts. Even if the government, we have now the government of uh, regulatory agency, Department of Environmental Protection, in our county has given them over 1,000 violations just in my county, and they will deny the existence of that or the meaning of that or the mm -hmm. impact of that. Mm -hmm. So they still have the idea that we are here for your good, for your good and for your improvement. And Phil Crosby just defines quality as the conformance to requirements. Mm -hmm. These corporations, they don't conform to any requirements. They write the rules. <laughs> and and Vera here, too. pardon me? And then they break those too. And then they break those too, right. Mm -hmm. And Vera here, I don't know if you care if I share this, the corporations went after her, having her charged by the district attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, with seven felonies. Six. Six felonies for being act, an activist. And those were all dismissed. The judge, judge Legg, Jason Legg, kind well, of a others, young... Others have been dismissed. But I've been in court 11 times, dragged by the in, uh, industry in the past five years. So I've been charged with felonies, mm -hmm. with misdemeanors, with civil and criminal charges. And I've had to have a whole bunch of attorneys that were pro bono or free for environmental and civil rights. And eventually everything got, I, I had to pay fines. I had to do probation. I had to do certain things to get rid of the felonies. So it's off my record. And then I uh, had some things dismissed recently, just the past year, that were criminal charges. So this is what happens if you are in the forefront in our country 
Uh, you will be dragged to court for over simple things like trespassing. They like that one as a charge. Um, criminal trespass, civil trespass. And luckily, none of us have been killed yet like they have in other countries. In Central and South America, in the Amazon, people are getting killed. Um, I believe probably other continents too, but mm -hmm. so far we're able to continue. But they do everything to intimidate us as much as possible. So most of the activists go underground. And there's only like about a handful of us that are up in the front, on the front lines. Mm -hmm. So they besmirch your name, they call you names, they write articles, they have complete front groups, several front groups that write and they make up things about us to make, to degrade us, to reduce our credibility mm -hmm. and spread lies about us. So it's a very strange thing to be involved in. <laughs> that would be environmentalism. I feel like we've been involved in saving the environment so that I would call environmentalism. Okay. And then also now environmental justice. So I think we're touching a lot of parts of this and it all comes together. It's about power, it's about corporations, it's about people. It all comes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, that relationship between people and place. Mm -hmm. It's this shift from understanding the environment as something that's out there and the environment as something that includes us, uh, something that we have a relationship to and responsibilities to. Um, and is inside of us. It's, yes, yeah, Because yeah. the air we breathe. Yes, yes, of course. We consume much more air than we do food or water. <laughs> it's like 10 times or something yeah, like yeah. that, the amount of air that we breathe in terms of, compared to water or food. So this shift from in, uh, environmentalism to environmental justice um, means that sustainability shifts from just a scientific question of resource management to a cultural question of how we live, work, and play. Uh, that sustainability has, yes, environmental, but also economic aspects, and that conservation means protecting not only natural communities, ecological communities, but also the human communities inside them. Um, so would someone like to read this quote by Wendell Berry? Oh yeah, also just thank you for sharing your personal story. Mm, right. You're welcome, yes. Oh, yeah, we just gave it that. Oh, yeah. There's a little bit of Go up. No, it's not in that section. It's local, the greatest uh, practical urgency and value. This is what is meant and is all that is meant by sustainability. The fertility cycle turns by the law of nature. The cultural cycle uh, turns on affection. And this now, is Wendell Berry and... We're in a lecture from like 2012 or so. So now we're going to go and talk about the uh, early history of Binghamton. Uh, we're going to talk about the first peoples who lived here, and we're going to talk, and then we're going to move into early white settlement. Um, talk about some of the ideas behind that, some of the ideas that propelled that. Uh, then we'll move into industrialization and eventually get today, and then eventually talk about the future. So. Okay. okay. So first, before we get into. Um, the uh, colonization, we want to talk about the first peoples who were here before all of us. So that would be the Oneida and the Onondaga, and they are both part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois. So they were, an important thing to consider that they existed in this land for tens of thousands of years. While the Confederacy itself like, existed for approximately like 600 years prior to like European contact, um, they were able to like subsist off this land for tens of thousands of years. And um, a lot of those, um, a, lot of, a lot of the ways they like uh, existed on this land, uh, con like conservation was like embedded into all of their practices. And it was based on generations of um, learning from the environment. And, uh, but, uh, and then this is a quote by um, Chief Oren Mines of the Onondaga from 1978. So, would someone like to read this yeah. out loud? I'll read it. If you don't mind. Yeah, Chris. Our economy was unlike that of Western peoples. We believe that all things in the world were created by what the English language forces us to call spiritual beings, including one that we call the great creator. All things in this world belong to the creator and the spirits of the world. We also believe that we are required to honor these beings, to respect in respect of the gift of life, our traditions were such that we were careful not to allow our populations to rise in numbers that would overtax the other forms of life. We practice strict forms of conservation. Our culture is based on a principle that directs us to constantly, constantly think about the welfare of seven generations into the future. 
our belief in this principle acts as a restraint to the development of practices which would cause suffering in the future. To this end, our people took only as many animals as were needed to meet our needs. Not until the arrival of the colonists did the wholesale slaughter of animals occur. Now, being a vegan, which I am, a strict vegan, raw vegan in the last four years, I can identify with this. Um, that is a, a, this chief do, deserves a reward <laughs> for publishing this, you know. Mm. Okay. And um, this is not just, uh, like, again, con conservation is a part of every aspect of, of their economy. So they settled mostly along the rivers here. Uh, and they lived off a mix of farm, farming, hunting, fishing, and gathering. Um, again, like in, in, like in the stream, they practice conservation. On the, uh, in like their gardens, they, they used a pretty much low labor, sustainable form of agriculture and moved their plots continuously. Um, same thing with hunting, same thing with gathering. <laughs> it was a the central uh, environmental ethic. Okay, so um, then as uh, European colonists came into the area, uh, this is a quote from George Washington, and um, I don't think we need to like read it out in full right now, but just the general idea is that this is the total destruction of just any like evidence that these lands are ever like occupied pretty much. So um, one thing I think this like represents just the like a lot of the ways they were able to sustain on this land for so long was built off like generations of like learning about the environment in which they lived in. And it kind of shows this um, mentality of like, it ties in with the general theme based on our title of like a linear form of upward progress because it's kind of the application of like, maybe the European form of agriculture works where, I mean, it's debatable, but maybe it worked for the, where they existed, but it's kind of just like, it's them applying it to every space they, uh, uh, invaded and just uh, ignoring the generations of information that people gathered from living there and understanding their environment and the destruction of all that both the like the environment itself but also the environmental knowledge that the people there had it just um, it represents the dangers of just seeing progress as like a linear thing because obviously progress isn't going to look the same everywhere you go because there's uh, when you just think of the environment specifically, like um, certain ideals of progress that are antiquated now lead, as we, as you can see, like just visually, like around us, like leads to degradation over time. Um, can, can I talk a little bit about the Sullivan expedition? Yeah. So the the Anasazi people, um, their their population was halved almost within decades of European uh, European um, settlement. Before they European contacted the disease, but they retained their lands and way of life up until the American Revolutionary War. Um, oh, sorry. No, I mean no. You can. The, the American it. Revolutionary War, where when they were forced to take a side, so they sided with the British, thinking the British were going to win. Originally, they remained peaceful, um, but in response, in retaliation to their siding with the British, the, uh, George Washington sent uh, an army led by General George Sullivan, G General James Sullivan, to uh, completely destroy their uh, way of life. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is just another quote by, uh, this is actually the quote that George said earlier. Oh. So, yeah. So, um, these are two more quotes, and this is just, um, I feel like we, I don't think we need to like say these verbatim again, but just, uh, the first quote is discussing how, uh, it's just kind of just the destruction of the generational knowledge and trying to apply just a completely like European way of life onto this land. So uh, the first quote is an early white settler, settler writing to a relative and discussing how um, uh, this, they destroyed all the environment in this area and the idea that from that like blank canvas they can like build up a civilization, which is like a loaded term, but like their idea of what they were bringing to the area. and. When you see like, the way they write, it's just the grouping of wolves, bears, and Native Americans. It just shows that they like they didn't even consider these people who were living here like human beings. They were just like grouped in with the environment. And then the next quote is another. Uh, it's kind of describing the same uh, phenomenon, 
and it's from a Native American writer, and uh, it just, they both describe the kind of the same idea of just the mass amounts of destruction that occurred before the Europeans believed that they could like bring progress, or like, like what their, their idea of progress was. And they say, there's a year there, but that might be a mistake. I mean, you're writing to a relative, 1979? Oh, yeah. It should have been uh, 17, 1879. Yeah. 18 or 17? 1779, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, you got used to writing 1970s. <laughs> um, we could do that. I'll just fix that now. So, I'm continuing on. Okay, so now moving on to like the early years of a European col like colonization of this area. So, uh, Binghamton itself was known as like the parlor city just because of the mass amounts of like, it basically was like a booming uh, area just because of the um, amount of like timber that they were able to gather from the forests and the agriculture that like this area attracted. So, and then certain industrial developments such as the Shenango Canal and the Oakwana Railroad. And this area was like doubling in population between 1830 and 1950 every decade. And this shows that like, yeah, their, um, their uh, style of uh, developing this land did yield like very like fast results. They like were able to like build up so quickly and like it kind of like embedded this idea of just like, yeah, like why weren't people doing this the entire time? Like this is the correct way of like using this land. But then, um, as will be revealed throughout, like later within the like presentation, like it didn't like survive. So this is just a, a picture that we found of the Binghamton area during like this time period. And as you can see, like all the mountains are pretty much like laid bare. There's like no trees on any of them. And that brings up an interesting point because when you think about it, I mean, not when you think, sorry, but like an interesting point that like a majority of the forest like in the Binghamton area is like regrowth. So a lot of it was like, was like completely cut down, and now like the forest that you see like surrounding like our campus today, a lot of that is just like has been regrown after the fact that it was all cut down. Yeah, because what's the oldest trees? Do you know on your campus? I mean, has anybody like checked out the the growth that is there? What what might be the age of the oldest trees? Could it be just fifty years? Likely not. Uh, yeah, likely not much longer than that. Um, all, these forests grew back once. Uh, agriculture was industrialized and we started shipping our food farther away. So the only reason the, the, the area is reforested is because there's deforestation somewhere else. <laughs> uh, when I, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is a very industrial urban area next to Newark, and my parents bought a house, and this house was set way back compared to the other houses because there was this huge tree in the front yard, and it was Wow, I think it was something like this, but it was they considered it about 200 years old. So they were willing to save the tree at that time and build the house <laughs> back. So we were like not in line with any of the other houses because we wanted to somebody wanted to save that tree. It was so important. And that tree was around like maybe when there were natives around. It was 200 years old. And then at some point after we left, so maybe the past 20 years, somebody eventually did cut it down. So to me, it's you know very sad and a painful thing to see a very old tree cut down. Same thing like the redwoods in California. They're like hundreds, maybe thousand years old. Yeah. And to cut any of them down should be like really against the law. It should, there should be a law in the books. Don't even consider doing it because it's like sacrilegious. <laughs> it's, it's like so sacred to have something last that long. And to even think of it is like beyond my comprehension. So that came to me when I see how the trees, how they eliminate them. I don't know what the population was at that point, or what year that um, slide might be. It says in the notes, I think it was uh, 1870. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, you can gather that like, it was still like a booming town, but um, I thought, and this is another interesting quote by Wes Jackson, uh, and it's just describing that like, the idea that these European um, who were coming to this land had the idea that they were like discovering it because from their point of view this land wasn't being used and that further ties into the idea of like what progress is because according to Europeans there wasn't progress being happening here because they was using this generation knowledge that was going on for like years and years and generations and generations so they didn't see like a booming town from their perspective 
So they believed that they were discovering this land because they were the first ones to implement their idea of what progress looked like. But um, that wasn't the case because it was still being used by the people that were, that were here. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately their form, their uh, like form of using this land uh, was sustainable for tens of thousands of years compared to like what eventually happened when it was um, colonized by the Europeans. But do you notice also that again, they're looking for something, they're looking for gold. They're always looking, especially the ones who are invading, they're looking for a resource mm -hmm. and they want to take it. So even going back then, what year do you think that might be? 1800s? Well, this is published I mean, in the 70s. That was by Columbus, so probably like yeah. 1492. Okay, okay 1400s, <laughs> they're already, they're st or even then thinking about extracting whatever they can of the resources of the land. They're not thinking uh, along different lines. So you already have that kind of mentality which is still the mentality now. Mm -hmm. So from 1400s to now, so what do we got? Like 700 years, 600 years, still the same mentality. We got to take out whatever we can and build something with it or make, take over, dominate. Yeah, I read yeah. all of Columbus's journals and he talks about, yeah, these Native Americans are idiots. They have so much stuff that they could exploit. They have so many resources and they're not doing mm. anything with them. They're just letting them sit there. And it's like, yeah, they're doing that because they're trying to be sustainable. They know what the environment needs, but he doesn't yeah. see that. Well, I think one thing that you see in this quote is just the imposition, like you say, that humans should naturally be above nature, not, uh, not intertwined with it. Mm. Um, like you give the example of the tree, how people cut that down, even though that is a peak part, that's a part of history, essentially. Yeah. It's you know, hundreds of years old. And I think this definitely speaks to the idea that humans are no longer part of the stages of ecological succession. Rather, <laughs> we are just an ecological disruption. <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't exactly matter. You know? And it's pretty upsetting. It is upsetting, but it looks like it started hundreds of years ago, the destruction, the mm -hmm. destructive yeah. model. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that uh, specifically. How was this ecological destruction basically the consequence, the con the conquest of the Haudenosaunee, uh, and the flip? What parallels does this relationship hold today, and has this process continued to the present? I think we're, we already started yeah. to have this conversation. I just want to put the questions up there. Um, you guys can just continue talking. Yeah, um, I also just thought it was interesting with the tree. It's kind of how like um, at one point in time, like uh, I guess like when you think about like. A long time ago, in like, but I guess the time difference like depends on where you're looking at. But it's like humans really structured their lives around nature. But nowadays, people usually like, structure nature around their lives. So even when you were talking about like earlier, like the places that we found like that were important to us, like a lot of us, like especially from the city, like mentioned like these pockets of nature that were just like vestiges in like these like really like urbanized environments. So it's mm -hmm. like we, um, so the city wasn't like. It wasn't like built to like compensate for like nature because like the island of Manhattan was one of the most like biologically diverse areas like in the entire world before it was like urbanized. But like none of you wouldn't know that today because it's a completely different area, like a completely different like bi like biome basically like than it was back before it was kind of taken over and like industrialized. So yeah, um, if anyone else has any like. Other well, points to make I about think now this. more people are getting aware that everything is sentient, everything is alive, mm -hmm. everything has some kind of intelligence or some kind of life force in it, whether it's a tree or whether it's a rock, wh whatever it might be, and that we need to honor it and that it's sacred. And we can't just bulldoze over everything, use all the machinery that we have and just crush things. Mm -hmm. and drill things like right now there's 1650 holes in my county that have been drilled 5,000 feet down and then 5,000 feet or more across so we got that going on right now and that's only in their vision one quarter of what they want to see they want to see at least 4,000 holes mm -hmm. and drill into one county mm -hmm. so it's, it's beyond comprehension. And when I saw my first rig in the county in 19, um, when was it, 10 years ago, 2008, and it was such a shock to my system 
to see that, and, and it was on a farm, to imagine that they would consider drilling 5,000 feet into the farm on that land and then bring up this resource that they thought they should have access to. You know, in China, they have to go down three times the depth that in the United States. So they aren't fracking in China. The reason they're not fracking is because they have to go too deep and the technology doesn't exist to do it. So China is blessed in that regard. You know, they're blessed because what they're doing is closing a, power, a coal power plant one a week to close it. Of course, Germany now is, is they're, they're getting rid of all of them. We don't need to go down to get our energy. We need to go up to get our energy. Yeah. Look to the sun. Look to wind. Yeah. Except geothermal. Yeah, that has to go down. Okay, awesome. So we're done this conversation. We're going to talk a little about, about the ideas behind this. So while met, Western New York was being continuously, progressively cleared, settled, and developed, Lewis Henry Morgan, an early anthropologist, was considered at the time to be the nation's like uh, greatest expert on American Indians. He lived with the Seneca tribe, which is just north of here, uh, for several decades. And in 1877, he published his most famous work called Ancient Society, based primarily on his uh, years with the Seneca. Uh, and in ancient society, he categorized human societies into three distinct stages or, or ethnical periods and characterized human history as an ascent towards ever greater st stages of human supremacy. Uh, he categorized the Iroquois as in the middle stage, barbarism. Um, the first stage, savagery, is discovered by our weaponry and pottery, then followed by the domestication of animals, agriculture, metalworking, and culminating at the highest stage of human supremacy uh, in the invention of alphabet writing and property. Yeah. Um, to Morgan, Western civilization represented the pinnacle of this achievement, and societies at a stage of savagery or barbarism became viewed as inherently inferior. And ultimately, this idea would be used to justify the continued con conquest of American lands and peoples in the name of progress. Uh, in an earlier work, uh, Morgan described the Iroquois people as follow. Would someone like to read this quote? Um, this is like a long quote, so to be honest, just like, maybe you're not intrigued. I mean, huh. OK. Or does someone want to read the entire quote? Yeah, or? I guess I could. Yeah. Okay. There is a fatal deficiency in Indian society. That's interesting, you know, they'd like to see that. In the non-existence of a progressive spirit, the same rounds of amusement, of business, of warfare, of the chase and of, a, of domestic intercourse continue from generation to generation. There was neither progress nor invention nor increase of political wisdom. Old forms were preserved, old customs adhered to. Thus civilized life when brought in contact with Indian life is wholly irresistible. Civilization is an aggressive as well as progressive state of society attacking every obstacle overwhelming every lesser agency and searching out and filling up every crevice, both in the moral and physical world. While Indian life is an unarmed condition, a negative state without inherent vitality and without powers of resistance, the institutions of the red man fix him to the soil with a fragile and precarious tenure, while those of civilized man in his highest estate, enable him to seize it with a grasp which defies displacement. There are but two means of rescuing the Indian from his impending destiny, and these are education and Christianity. The Indian must receive into his mind the light of knowledge and the spirit of civilization. Our language must be substituted for the Indian language, our religion for the Indian mythology, and our amusements and mode of life for theirs. The Indian nature must be forever subdued and submerged in that superior one which civilization creates. Okay, so that was like a long quote, so I don't know, does anyone want to like react to it? Because like there was a lot in that quote. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, how are both? It's terrible. Yeah. It's so it's just, like, uh, one thing I like unreal. wanted to like, one thing that struck me while I was like reading over the slide like earlier uh, today was just um, the entire like if you see the highly detection that goes from like civilization to resistance, it's kind of just like almost funny because it almost is like 
like a criticism of their idea of civilization inherently, just because it is aggressive and it just attacks every obstacle. And when you think of what their ideas of obstacles were, it was like the environment that was there originally. And so um, it just kind of like, I don't, it would be funny if it wasn't kind of so sad, just how like mm -hmm. blind they were to just the damage they were doing ultimately in the long run, and also just like how like objectively just like awful they were being as people. Yeah. Right. Oh. So how are both colonization and environmental destruction basic in Morgan's notion of human progress? And if you have how does this sorry, guys, no, yeah, yeah, no, no. What does this reveal about the assumptions behind Morgan's measures of human supremacy? Is Morgan's progress sustainable? And how do our no modern notions of progress compare? How have they changed? How have they remain the same? I uh, know anyone can start. <laughs> so if you just have any ideas about any of them or just like well, basically, colonization is in the environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. It's it's equated. It's synonymous. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have a problem with this. This is a major problem, and it, it continues. It's it's the demise of the planet, and of any cultures or civilizations. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that really strikes me, what we we're talking about, is that since since America has been colonized, you see that that recurring theme of consumption and uh, dominance over nature and ecological succession. And I think that's what he speaks to here when he talks about civilization as aggressive, is that um, it's not actually progressive. It's it's just institutionalized barbarism, essentially. Mm. Um, I think he's getting at the fact that a lot of people uh, notion progress as civilization. They're synonymous with one another. But in reality, they're not. Um, they're just essentially manipulative forms of destruction. Yeah. So it's interesting, they call it the natives barbarism, the native culture, but it's actually the civilization people or the colonizers who are barbaric. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And like, even when you think of like, cause like Henry Louis Morgan for his time, he probably believed he he probably believed that he was like our idea of progressive. Like he was like, Oh, I like the Native Americans and I want them to survive. So to survive they have to like adopt our customs and stuff. He did live with them and he did like um, there was like certain Native Americans that he worked with and like the way he wrote about them is just it was kind of like infantilizing. It was kind of like he viewed them as like uh, like a group of like people that were too like stupid to understand what they had, and like that was kind of touched on earlier when um, we discussed like the idea of like resources being extracted with like Christopher Columbus and stuff. So it just goes to show how like even sometimes people who believe they have like the best interests at heart for the environment or the um, people who live there oftentimes end up not, and just end up like making things worse. So. Yeah, continuing on, it's just, um, it's so, um, the same idea, oh, sorry, yeah. so the, oh, I just want to say something. So the basic idea, uh, to sum up that conversation, is that for something to be uh, developed, it must first be undeveloped. Uh, for something to be civilized, it must first be uncivilized. Uh, I'm using these verbs, these as verbs, not adjectives, uh, these not as verbs, these, these as verbs, not adjectives. So undevelopment, uh, uncivilized, uncivilization is referred to processes of erasure. For instance, early maps of the United States um, left, uh, like, early maps of the United States le left much of the country's interior as blank space. There were no indigenous nations, no rivers, plains, or forests, but just empty land. Uh, empty land. But of course, there's no truly empty land, that's what we were talking about earlier, in terms of, um, because every, almost every corner of this earth is crawling with life and rich with human culture. Um, there's no surplus nature. If we take it all, there's nothing left for others. Uh, so this narrative of emptiness necessitates a very physical emptying. In America, uh, this meant the rivers were dammed, the forests were cut, the earth was tilled, uh, and the native people were murdered or forcibly removed. And this way, a certain level of violence and destruction is basic uh, to the process of development. Uh, Morgan's racism is a perfect example of this. Um, in order for the genocide of Native Americans uh, to be written down as progress, their cultures had to be written as primitive, and their lands had to be written as empty or at least unproductive. Okay, so yeah, that's like a really good like, thing on this. 
before we move on to the next, so yeah, before we move on to our next topic, which is going to be industrialization and pollution of the Binghamton area, anyone have any like final thoughts on like that section or like the idea of like colonization aspect of like environmental justice? If not, it's okay. Cause I'm just... Well, one of the thoughts I've had, even being going through what I'm going through the past ten years, I have uh, stated many times that it's almost like karma. We removed the natives from our land in Pennsylvania, where I am, besides other areas, and we decimated them. And now it's the white people's turn. Like in our, my community, it's in the other rural areas, it's mostly white. Now it's your turn, I said. Now you can feel what it's like to be dominated, to be subjugated, and to be even genocided with the practices that they're bringing in because they're bringing in toxic practices. Mm -hmm. So now you can see what it's like and it's our turn to see them take over the farms and do whatever they want in our communities, yeah. take over the political structure also, so that we now have to fight for our lives to it's stay, a, to stay alive. It, it sets a precedent, right? So um, there's never enough. There's always, there's always someone who will be the surplus people. Yeah, I was, yeah, was kind of like... Adam. And they did. They called us, the people who came in, who were representing the industry, they called us the sacrifice zones. We are to be sacrificed. And they said it openly. And I feel like that's such like an echoing of like the type of just terminology used during like these times that we think we're so removed from, like the 1800s and stuff. Like, and it's just like... That just like goes to demonstrate just how ingrained in the our relation to the environment is ingrained into how we treat other people because people are parts of the environment. So when you're willing to like disregard the environment and like during one like one time until you change those principles about yourself like entirely and like really examine those, which hasn't really been done since uh, like the first colonization of America, uh, it goes. It like continues just in more forms. So just like how like how that happens to Native Americans now it's happening to the populations living in those areas today. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna move on to the industrialization and pollution uh, focusing on the being. I feel like we already like so probably talk a lot about it, but just like if you see this it's kind of to go with the show, just they really they really did that. Like they really um, just so clearly illustrated just how they, between just all the forms, and like how like George was talking about how like the maps of the United States like portray the land as empty, you can see how in this painting like there's nothing as far as you can see except for the man-made aspects. Like, you can see canal in the background, there's like ships, there's like till land in the front. And you see on the side of the painting like there's like a group of Native Americans like running from like the uh, symbol of American progress. And in the back corner, you can see you can see a herd of buffalo. And I feel like uh, one thing, like we didn't put it on the side directly, but like it's such like a like clear like imagery of that. It's just if you've seen if you've gone been in like a U.S. history class and seen just like the map and like buffalo skull, just how like yeah. So uh, that was just like a painting we included because it kind of like illustrated a lot of like points and it kind of showed our theme of just like upward, like the idea of upward progress and like what that represents and like the construction that brings in like taken into account. So this is just a discussion on the like basically the liquidation of the forest and like the area. So and in addition to that, the introduction of like toxic uh, industries into the area. So between like the industrial tanneries and things like that, it impacted the people living here, both like in native communities and that they were like forced off their land, but mm -hmm. also the people that were living here that like even colonized this area because they then were like neighbors with uh, industries that ended up like um, leaking like toxic like leachates into their environment and like like into the air that they breathe. So yeah, this is a picture of like a hemlock forest being like completely like liquidated from this area. And from this area for the tanneries. Yeah. And the tanneries were major pollutant polluters. Yeah. Besides IBM. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like kind of like a pre-IBM, like just like how like the shoe factory was like a major source of industry before IBM, it's kind of like the tanneries or like the toxic plume before the IBM. Mm -hmm. It's just one toxic plume after another really. Yeah. So wherever you have industry, it's basically a pollution 
they're polluters. Uh -huh. So until we can insist that all industry can, must be non-polluting, we will continue to have this uh -huh. trend. Yeah, and that's why like a lot of many industry towns in the like anywhere you go in the world, anywhere anywhere where there is industrialization, it's usually located around the rivers. That's mm. why Binghamton's where it is, Syracuse is where it is, Rochester, etc. Because water is necessary, not just for waste, like the obvious use of cheap waste removal, but also used mm. to cool machinery early on so that like it could mm. continue functioning. So it serves that dual purpose as a free exploited resource as well. Yeah, and now they're pulling how many millions of gallons of water out of the Susquehanna in Susquehanna County? I don't know. They don't tell us, but there's a lot of water being pulled out of Susquehanna County's uh, out Susque of the rivers. Susquehanna it's, River, yeah. I think for the the latest polluters. Mm. So it's it's unreal. And also, just like one quick aside, like because like uh, the idea of these tanneries, like. There was like going back to the Native Americans, the colonization aspect. Like, they were Native Americans tanning leather before European industrialists came and like set up huge factories that ended up like impacting the environment in such a huge way, like they did. So like, it kind of just, like shows that like a lot of it is tied into like corporations and industrializing industry, industry, kind of like taking environment for granted, and not embedding sustainability into their practices. So. These are just more images of just like those, like, kind of just like how kind of industry kind of grew in size exponentially in Binghamton. So this is just like huge stacks and stacks of like tan beds with uh, the leather turn about and like, like kind of like going back to that 200 year old tree that you mentioned in, that was in your front yard. Like you can see the size of that tree is almost like as wide yeah. as that person's tall. So you can imagine the history, like how far that tree goes back in time. And it's like, it's being torn down for just another tannery, probably. And, mm, yeah, because sure. it's even, like, it's up a number, like, some over 800 years. Like, that's, like, it's so outside of our even conception as human beings of, like, how long that is. So, um, and then these are just, like, early, early images of the industry. It's, like, going back to, like, how, like, it began. And, like, what we want to illustrate here is just, like, you can see how, like, from... This, like, if you look at the number of people, it kind of like it gets kind of like scary almost. It's, you see here there's rows and like, see here's like one table, a couple tables. Here it's rows and rows and rows and a full parking lot. And then here's where it's like <laughs> reached to like the max, where it's like uh, IBM in 1950, where it's just a sea of people and it's just you see like <coughs> no nature at all. You just see like mm. huge buildings. And I like that quote. What the heck does he mean by that? We must never be satisfied. Exactly. Like yeah. They can I'm never sure. be satisfied. They have to keep going, going, going till there's nothing left. Like in the movie, The Lorax. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's nothing left until you have to have everything out of plastic. Mm -hmm. Always progressing. Well, Always yeah. progressing. I think it's like, like that. That picture alone speaks to the notion of industrialization and its development and progress. And, um, I mean. There's a lot of people, and usually whenever a place has a lot of people, that's good. As an increase in population, it means it's a positive environment. But if you look at Binghamton nowadays, we have one of the sharpest declining populations of all cities, in, of all metropolitan areas in New York. And I think it, it was, it's, it's a perfect example of what industrialization can do to an area in the long run. Is when you reap the material benefits of something, in the long run it really isn't that progressive. It doesn't lead to that development for a long time for a long time it's like the bust and boom syndrome exactly i was actually going to just say you can't just look at industrialization in isolation because there's a context to it in binghamton specifically it's always relied on war world war one world war two providing mm -hmm. for um soldiers like just basic like wearable goods and then ibm in the cold war and once that industry is um, finished with its business, it's able to leave and create the economic disparity that we see today, um, which is so unfortunate because the citizens who are here, like, they're not necessarily the ones at fault. It's like the industries and those in control and then firing like major chunks, like one third of the entire like industry that gives people their like ability to live. Um, it was really unfortunate.
And if they took into consideration, like the Indian chief said, look seven generations ahead. Look seven generations and then plan your world, your industry. Take that major thing. If you looked at the whole Rust Belt, you can see just the decay and the destruction of industrialized America. And oh, yeah. It shows you how industrialization might be good in the short term, but in the long run, we're seeing some very drastic industrial effects from it. And um, I think like, it's also the kind of ties into the um, Lewis Henry Morgan quote um, that we heard earlier. I'll put it up because like, you were here. But um, this kind of ties into the idea that like the definition of industry and um, civilization will progress as aggressive and removing every obstacle as like a positive. And then you look at like these pictures, like you don't see any ob like all the obstacles were removed. So you would think like. So from Lewis Henry Morgan's um, like perspective, like this is like perfect, like wow, there's no obstacles, there's no Native Americans, there's no trees, there's no nature. But like when we come to understand that like those obstacles are things that end up like giving us like life, that's like it kind of like self defeating starts. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Like in the 1950s, what was like the racial makeup of this town? Because obviously you we'll see, see there it's, it's from Eastern Europe. Yeah, because I was just wondering, because you see everyone in that photo working there is like white, and I was wondering like if that's the people who are benefiting. It was, uh, European immigrants were coming in to work in the factories. Mm -hmm. Especially, uh, and that ties into the, cycle, the war cycle, so um, a lot of the early industrialization here was really pushed by the First World Wars. Um, if you go back to the Endicott Shoe Factory slide, uh, Binghamton became like the primary shoemaker for the U.S. military during that time. Yeah. Um, at the same time, these wars were destroying the economy, was destroying local economies in Europe. So after the wars, a lot of people came here to create the computers uh, and to, uh, that were used to organize the Cold Wars later with IBM. So it's that kind of cycle of destruction over there and creates the emigration, which creates the need for this stuff here. Yeah, but that's a really good question. Like, I think, like, while, well, like, it's true that like a majority of the people living here and like obviously like the people like in this photo like are all like Eastern European immigrants mostly like I feel like it's something we could also look into just like because I like, feel like if the Eastern Europeans are the ones getting the jobs but like communities of people of color and potentially even Native Americans still are just the ones primarily being included or whatever. Yeah. I don't there, know. There weren't very many Native Americans living here at this point. Yeah. Uh, Oh hey, but yeah, but that's also like because um, I don't think we have like cause there could be a whole another like presentation like about this topic so discussing like the impact of like slavery on this area because like it was definitely like a major hub for that and that's something we don't even like get into on this presentation but like it's something that like we get into it's just like thank you all for that question it's actually really good um, but yeah like so we talked about this quote already so like we must never be satisfied and it's just like. I don't know, maybe I just have like a thing for wordplay between like the upper upward like state motto and like this. So it's just kind of like so funny just to me how like they both like we're seeing from this perspective like if we just continue to just like take up more and more and more, that's like obviously gotta be good because we're just gonna get more stuff. But like it's this idea that like it's not under it's not like taking into account that like maybe there aren't like infinite resources available and we can't just like hoard all of it to ourselves and like so like, wait, that's not the, okay, there you go. So yeah, so like, just like how you brought up the whole like boom and bust thing, I guess it's starting to get into the bust aspect. So IBM, we were finally getting to it, long awaited. But um, so uh, in the 90s, so after the Cold War has already ended, um, Soviet Union fought, like fell. Um, so IBM no longer is like profiteering from all those like Cold War related like jobs that they were like being able to offer. So uh, they were they, the layoffs that happened were kind of cataclysmic to the like the, the, the area. So um, like less than ten percent of its peak like employment like is where it is at today. And like so it left it took all the jobs with it as it left, and it, all it left behind was like the pollution in the air, water, and soil. And yeah, so this is a video that George actually like he edited down. So it's a collection of like a, a lot of like documentaries and like films produced by local Binghamton like uh, both activists and just members of the community. 
uh, discussing the impact of IBM and like what it did to the and uh, so yeah. uh, before I start the video, anyone have any? Like, What's the video about? I missed it. It's about the uh, IBM spill in the 70s and going and doing the fracking waste uh, being brought in from Seneca Meadows. So a uh, little background. Um, as IBM left, they transferred ownership, and I'll be talking about this, they transferred ownership over a lot of the waste treatment facilities. Eventually, as manufacturing declined, those waste treatment facilities became commercial uh, dumping facilities and where the, the, the majority of the landfill leachate from the largest um, landfill, landfill, Seneca Meadows, uh, over in Seneca Meadows, uh, in New York State is being processed. A lot of that goes back to fracking. A lot of the fracking waste from Pennsylvania is being processed. In, uh, is it really? Oh, that I'm not sure about. But I did go for a tour of the whole facility, the waste treatment facility. They give tours. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to see what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it'll talk about everything in the video. It's spilled a couple times. Yeah, so credits to George. Like, this Who's is like a lot longer of a video before it got edited down, so like. And who created the video? It's, it's I didn't create the video, it's just a, a combination of videos from, oh. um, I'm sure you know, you know him, Bill Hustle Houston. So I just took, yeah, I just, he's, uh, he has a, uh, he's kind of, he has a bad reputation, but he, he put some videos online and explained the situation and put them together into one video. Oh, okay. Can anyone not hear? Yeah, this is Bottom. And in New York State, that leaching is required to be collected. And that's the material that we're talking about here tonight. Seneca Meadows is the largest landfill in New York State, 2,600 acres. It receives household and industrial waste from five states, including New York City, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Are we confirming, have we confirmed that, uh, that EIT is receiving landfill leachate from Seneca Meadows? Is that what I'm hearing, that you did confirm that? That's uh, the direction I was pointed in, yes. <laughs> it doesn't sound very... Uh, well, no, I don't want to say yes, and you know, I'm sure you're going to study it and look at your paperwork, and you know, I mean, it's uh, yes, I'll say yes. When people think about a contaminated site, a lot, a lot of people, you know, the standard is Love Canal uh, that a lot of people think about, um, but very few people really understand that Endicott in Broome County is also a mini Love Canal. It's another Superfund site. IBM Corporation got its start in Endicott somewhere around 1911 or so, and there was a history of contamination, groundwater contamination due to neglect, accidents, and even intentional dumping here. So the waste treatment plant, um, there's a waste treatment plant on this facility, on this site here, that was built, as far as I can tell, it was built in the 1970s. I'm not sure of the exact date. The purpose was to treat and to dispose of their, their process wastes that were created during manufacturing of these circuit boards. Uh, in 1979, uh, IBM reported a spill of 4,100 gallons of TCE, it's also called methyl chloroform and a few other different names. It's a commonly used solvent in electronics manufacturing. Um, a report prepared by IBM indicated that this uh, chemical spill, plume, was larger than expected and contained other industrial solvents. Um, all of these seeped into the groundwater. In 2002, IBM found that these volatile organics had uh, in fact moved into the air in buildings uh, on and around the spill site and in 2004, 
Endicott was classified as a class two Superfund site, and that's defined as a significant threat to public health and or the environment requiring action. And so that was 2004. Just prior to that, in 2002, IBM got a sense that they needed to get out of here. So IBM transferred ownership of the buildings and the assets to a pair of companies. One was called Endicott Interconnect, and the other is called Huron Campus. Huron Campus owns the buildings, and Endicott Interconnect was the company that continued the board manufacturing for IBM as a subcontractor. It was the same players, basically, but they changed the name to protect the guilty. EIT, Endicott Interconnect, promised to retain jobs in return for about $30 million in tax deferments. Uh, EIT not only failed to retain these jobs, but in fact they had massive layoffs for about 10 years and finally declared bankruptcy in July 2013. But as, as manufacturing dwindled, the facility started processing less and less wastes. The facility needs to process a minimum volume of these wastes in order to keep the facility kind of running. So the managers at Endicott Interconnect, that's what it was called at the time, they hatched a plan to turn the waste treatment facility into a commercial dumping operation, right? It was originally to handle their own self-generated wastes, but then they said, well, maybe we can make some money off of this thing. So Jim Little and Mark Bacon, in February of 2013, they noticed a massive cleanup operation going on, and after some investigation, they discovered that a valve on a rusty tank had broken and dumped the entire contents of this raw, unprocessed leachate into the storm drains, which dumped directly into the Susquehanna River. If you follow the storm sewers where the Endicott Interconnect Waste Treatment Facility dumps into the river, it's coincident with the primary water well used by the village of Endicott as their drinking water supply. It's a shallow well just under the Susquehanna River. Here's the water well, and here's the storm drain where Endicott Interconnect dumps these treated toxic landfill leachates into the Susquehanna River. And um, somebody made a foil, it was either Jim Little or it might have been Scott Laufer, uh, who's also on the call, uh, foiled DEC and it was confirmed at that time that this pilot program for leachate processing existed since 2011. And they admitted at that time that they were processing up to 80,000 gallons per day at this facility. Uh, Western Broom Environmental Stakeholders Coalition, Coalition had its first meeting on this with DEC officials in February of 2014. Uh, video of that meeting is online, you can watch it. Uh, they said the permit was, the Speedy's permit was up for renewal and um, they said they were gonna you know, be in touch very soon. Well, it turned into a two-year delay. Here we are now. A second meeting was held with DEC in May, just May of this year. That video is online as well, to announce that the permit was basically ready, nearly ready. Uh, DEC printed a public notice we didn't know when it was going to happen exactly the precise date, but they sent uh, they published a public public notice of availability of the draft permit on Friday, July first. Now, if you know anything about the media, you know that when they have a very serious thing to report, they always report it on Friday. It's called the news dump day because they know nobody's going to read it, and even if they could read it, there's no news cycle for two more days so it diffuses the response. So this was not only done on a Friday, it was done on a holiday Friday. Just basically signed off on this um, unpermitted activity. It was not part of their, uh, their original Speedy's permit. The last thing I wanna say is what DEC told us 
when we had this meeting on May in uh, May of this year, they basically said they don't have the regula regulatory authority to deny I three um, uh, the the right to basically turn this facility into a commercial dumping operation. DEC said they never de they almost never deny a permit, but they also denied that they were a rubber stamp machine. But they said. Basically, if the form is filled out right, they're going to you know, permit, permit this. Um, they don't perform safety ins inspections to check the integrity of the tanks, which we know are in bad shape because they've leaked once 17,000 gallons uh, in 2013. Raw leachate went straight to the river, which is how we found out about this whole thing. It would still be a secret if it wasn't for that. DEC almost never assesses any fines for non-compliance with regulations. DEC says there are no limits to how much effluent I-3 can dump into the Susquehanna River as long as it meets, quote, clean water standards. But they never really check. Um, DEC never performs independent testing of influent or effluent um, of this. All reporting is self-reporting and is basically the honor system. Um, DEC does not have staff to check all these permitted sites that exist throughout the state, and they said a public hearing is highly unusual. It reminds me of the old days with the gold rush. This place used to be booming. The IBM had 18,000 people over there. Now IBM is employing about 800 left. I know last summer they had about 1,400. You go around this town, all the stores are vacant, empty, the properties are run down because nobody wants to put money into them and the taxes are way too high. And, you know, the only thing that's missing is the tumbleweeds. Instead of tumbleweeds, we got ventilation systems. Okay, so shout out to George and I'm going to be So, here's the Yeah. So would someone like to read this quote from Helena Norberg Hodge? She was an anti-globalization activist in the early 2000s. Until about 500 years ago, local cultures throughout the world were the products of dialogue between humans in a particular place, growing and evolving from the bottom up in response to local conditions. Cultures have absorbed and responded to outside influences such as trade, but the process of conquest, colonialism, and development that has affected so much of the world is fundamentally different. It has forcefully imposed change from the outside. And since the end of the world and since the end of World War II, the forces dismantling local economies has grown far more powerful. Today, speculative investment in transnational corporations are transforming every aspect of life. People's language, their music, their buildings, their culture, their agriculture, and the way they see the world. That top down form of cultural change works against diversity, against the very fabric of life. Mm -hmm. Um, so what do the principles of environmental justice tell about being human's history and development? Um, starting with colonialism, we're looking at industrialism, uh, and potentially looking at the future. And uh, specifically, what has being human's past development been dependent on, and what was the possible in the future? Is it desirable? What alternatives might exist? So if there's any, any ideas. It just shows that environmental injustice continues. Mm -hmm. And it will continue, and I don't know when it can stop, unless there's enough people that can stand up for justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I don't know, just throw my two cents in. Like, it kind of like, like, to go back to kind of like the Warren County landfill, uh, point, so we kind of started the presentation with this kind of just like, just connecting with your point. It's like all about if, like, the people of the neighborhood that's being impacted, or the community that's being impacted, it's up to them to really like fight back because the corporations themselves aren't going to like put the pe the community's needs at their priority. It's going to be more about their profits, and that's that aspect. Well, the problem is when they come in, they have to ask us. We're not asked. The people are not asked. We have to be part of the decision. They have to inform us. We're not informed. They only give us partial information. We need to have lots of information. We have to be part of the decision-making process. And then we have to ask, is this going to be good for seven generations from now? And if it's not, then we cannot say yes to you coming into our community. So 
And we're not asked that. We're not part of the process. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can just, yeah, hi. You can just say something. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely, I, I think that's a really great point in terms of, <clears throat> and especially, I guess, in conjunction with, like, the prior quote, um, that I forgot what the name was. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, that I think is, like, a really great explanation in terms of, I guess, like, how, I guess, colonialism works, but how it can you know, work on, like, a smaller scale as in, I guess, like, a business planting itself into a community um, without like any investment whatsoever in terms of like how, like what is like the actual function of that community, what's the health of that community and the people um, in it. And it's like, you, you can't really, I guess, like get around that in any sort of way, like around like any sort of company, like just like, you know, you know uh, any sort of like multinational company um, will have the ability, will have the capital to just, you know, uh, all right, it seems like this seems like a good place to like set up a headquarters. And, I mean, like it just happened with, like it's like Amazon and, uh, yeah, and Long Island City and like enough people were able to, you know, organize to like stuff, prevent that from happening. But, you know, it would have been very similar in how, you know, these corporations that are very parasitic and how they, um, you know, set up base take the resources and leave the waste behind. And that doesn't really stop unless the people who are working, um, the laborers who are working in those corporations, in those factories, have control over how those, those um, how those factories, how that industry is run. Because otherwise there's no, there's no profit, there's no motive for a company to you know, actually take care of you know, the immediate environment around that factory. Um, if the people who are working there have control over it, then you know they live there. They not just work there; they live there. So mm -hmm. that's the, like all the incentive for people to um, you know make sure that this is a sustainable, that this is a healthy way to um, run whatever industry that is. Yeah. Additionally, with Binghamton in particular, we have this post-industrial economy and. Um, we've seen, like, I remember my freshman year just like driving through Binghamton, not being familiar with what Broome County's economic history was, just thinking that this place was really decrepit. And there are a lot of students on this campus, just to also talk about like the university to community relationship. Like, there are a lot of students who, in a very uh, high and mighty way, will say, like, we create the economy here, and that's not a good thing, and that's not a good thing pride in like right now Binghamton from my understanding has a very seasonal economy because of the university and a service based economy and unfortunately if Binghamton were to like if you were to try to recreate I was trying to not make too much noise like economic maybe self-sufficiency or betterment could, needs to be found from a grassroots level here and that's something that um, I feel really strongly about because we have like parasitic corporate we've seen parasitic companies come in and take advantage and right now I think um, one example of that is Sodexo working on the working on campus at university people from the community I mean, they do employ a lot of disabled people which is awesome but at the same time um, to what end is it really bringing them up out of like the same stagnant economic um, stratification that we see today? So um, it's left. It's about creating some sort of like community economy um, in order to like form that betterment and change the like <coughs> like really like strict stratification that is seen today. I think also one of like. Just to put it out there, like there were students a couple years ago who were working really hard to get like a Binghamton, um, like Broome County food co-op to be created, and like that plan is really just like came and went and came and went, and it would be a really awesome economic as well as educational opportunity for people in the community and working with community members. So um, it's hard for students to keep up with because we only have like a most of us have a four-year like time period here mm -hmm. so we can't act as much of as of support to the community as is needed yeah what do you think about the new hemp processing plant that's coming in 
Um, I, don't, I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about it? But that might be hopefully a more ethical, humane type of industry. And they're, they're going to have two processing plants in the Binghamton area and the BU area. So I think that might be something worthwhile. The growing of hemp, the development of it, the processing of it, and the, that would be an industry that could be a positive for this area. Yeah, it all, I think, depends also on like the amount to which like the work, the people who are like working in the processing facilities have their voices heard and mm -hmm. are able to unionize or have some um, form of like bargaining ability with the people who are running the company. I know there are local farms who do hemp stuff and CBD type products, mm -hmm. um, which are really awesome, but usually like family based from my understanding or just like really small groups. So I don't know what that would look like with the processing facility. Yeah, it's saying uh, like invest 150 million, 400 jobs. Um, mm -hmm. I, I only just opened up the page. But. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the whole idea of development, going back to, we're talking about Lewis Morgan and the idea of civilization, and how that was a inherently erasing process, um, and then industrialization, how that kind of set the precedent, as you were saying, the conquest of the first peoples kind of set the precedent for the next conquest of the rural people, mm. uh, and, and the process of industrialization set idea of development had this um, same erasure built into it. Um, but all that is dependent, oh, sorry, the, present, the computer analyzer, all that is dependent on the existence of a frontier. Uh, and it's dependent on that because it's dependent on um, pushing that growth against some, some border. And it's not clear whether if we're going to have that frontier uh, for this process to be continued. So we need to be rethinking about how we uh, define progress in that sense. Um, and what do you guys think about that? We'll go, we'll go into two different visions once Anthony comes back with the thing. Okay. Um, how sorry. do we change, yeah, I go. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I was giving you some logic behind that. And, and at every point, it creating, um, externalizing all these costs onto uh, whether it's a conquest of Native Americans and then it's the health risks for poor communities in this area. Um, I think clearly this is this this mood is, this uh, development mindset is failing. Would someone like to read this quote from Lewis Mumford? He was a uh, historian of technology. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if we do not take time to review the past, we shall not have sufficient insight to understand the present or command the future. The past never leaves us, and the future is already. Okay, so clearly the scientific uh, principles of sustainability are pretty like dry cut, right? So that's um, uh, so, so like that's like nutrient cycling, biodiversity, renewable energy materials, and population control. Um, but the cultural and social principles of sustain sustainability are very much uh, debated, and generally there are two visions uh, for a sustainable society. It's a biospheric vision. Uh, which is saying alternative development. The future is envisioned as a reformed extension of the present. So taking this history and reforming it and continuing that, that process in, into the future, um, the, the biospheric vision attempts to essentially manage the re centrally managed resources and is based on the belief that sustain sustainability is rooted uh, in global cooperation made possible by vast networks of trade and communication. It's dependent on mega projects such as dams, canals, centralized power grids, uh, pipelines, etc. Uh, the opposing vision is the bioregional vision. This is alternatives to development. The future in this vision is, in, is, is understood as a radical departure from the present. Uh, and in this understanding, sustainability comes from local knowledge and rootedness. Uh, and the, and the man, resources are managed locally through a decentralized set of autonomous regions and small scale infrastructure, appropriate technologies, uh, and, depend, uh, and dependence on local environment. At the core at the, of this debate are two opposing understanding of, uh, understandings of development. So biospheric futures follow the thinking of Lewis Henry Morgan in viewing our present as the highest stage of human development and history as a progressive ascent to supremacy. Uh, the ecological crisis doesn't question this development, but calls for more of it. 
Uh, there's no sustainability without development and no development without sustainability. That's kind of like the motto for alternative development. Um, so these, so alternative development, sustainable development, green growth, these should, should all be pursued with greater intensity than ever before. Uh, and in short, the biospheric perspective imagines the, future, imagines the future by extending the present. But in the bioregional perspective, converging crises of environmental degradation, climate change, global in inequality, call into the very fundamental assumptions behind uh, these historical processes, behind development. Uh, it's in infinite material progress. Is infinite material progress possible on a finite planet? So rather than looking for alternative developments, bioregional futures imagine alternatives to development by drawing inspiration from cultures that have been able to live sustainable, sustainably for thousands of years. In short, the bioregional the bio perspective imagines the future by exploiting our more sustainable past. Um, so, which of these strategies is currently dominant? Why is it dominant and is it working? How might the environmental history of Binghamton help us navigate between these two visions? Which is preferable and how can we make this vision possible? And can opposing biospheric and bioregional visions be reconciled? And if so, what might this compromise look like, if not why? Uh, does anyone have any idea how we could start tackling these questions? And um, no rush, we can just wait. You have something to say. So, um, a lot of our like development, when you look at like industries that are like trying to promote like like core, like a green audience, like they're like they talk about how sustainable their like increased industrialization is, whether it's through like recycling or just stuff like that. But it isn't really targeting the root of the issue, where it's like mm -hmm. this continued growth is what's like causing it's, like this infinite consumption of infinite consumption of resources that are like finite in themselves. But um, I don't know. Here's any other ideas about it. It's it's still basically a domineering society. Mm -hmm. I don't see the big difference. I mean, we have recycling, big deal. Yeah. You know, we have a group in uh, Binghamton called uh, Sustainability. Yeah. With Adam Flint. Yeah. And, you know, they're pushing for solar, but the main thing is the root of the problem. Yeah. Right. The the whole tradition of this culture yeah. that goes back hundreds of years. Thousands of years. So how do we get to the root of it and be able to admit to it? Yeah. So like when I talk to the people from the gas industry, and they recently came, four of my friends are in court right now being uh, charged uh, and harassed in the uh, Montrose system courthouse. And I said to the representative, I said, he mentioned jobs. He's like, you know, they bring so many jobs and he, they're always proud of it. We bring jobs. I said, but there's all kinds of jobs. We want yeah. ethical, moral jobs. And then we have to jobs. Huh? Integrating jobs. Integrating. So we have to define those things. We have to discuss it. We have to group discussions about it. And we have to understand what do we really want? Mm -hmm. Because as far as I'm seeing right now, they're not ethical. They're not moral. They're just jobs to get the most profit out of the people, the workers, and then the, the, the system itself or the environment is sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Besides the workers, they're being exposed mm -hmm. to all the risks that are involved. Mm -hmm. The jobs are immediate, but they're not made with dignity or with like consideration for those, like for like the larger impact of the industry and also like the negative extra externalities like health costs, for example, as well. Um, and I think that's also like a global aspect, like industries will use like the two main arguments that I've seen is greenwashing, like Anthony just said, and then also like, oh, we're do like expanding at the same time as we're like going green and that usually is like another way to get tax breaks. Like it's not regulated well, it's just like a label. And then also the argument of jobs and everyone falls for that argument, especially in America. Um, we have a very workerist idea and like it's all about creating more jobs, creating more jobs rather than allowing people to define the roles that they have and mm -hmm. um, have ones that are like the most important, as you said, ethical. 
Well, I just went to a county commissioner's meeting. I go there periodically and I videotape and ask questions and make comments. And this last meeting, which was last Wednesday, um, I asked the commissioners, you know, about the jobs and I had looked in their special brochure they have. Less than 2% of the jobs are directly to the gas industry in Susquehanna County. Mm -hmm. So a very small percentage, but meanwhile they talk as if it's much bigger. And then they said and admitted, we have 200 jobs here in this county that can't be filled. We have 200. I said, really, why, can you say? And I mean, I had some idea, but they can't get the workers because the jobs are not that desirable to begin with. Mm -hmm. You have 12 hour shifts, six, hour, six days a week. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't wanna do that besides the repetitiveness of it and the exposure to risk. Yeah. So you got 200 jobs they can't even fill. Mining is the first form of slavery. Right, <laughs> so it's a form of slavery, like, the, like the quarries. Yeah, too. if you either keep people away from being able to have any other option or pay them a lot of money to work uh, with, with those kind of processes. Right. Yeah. Uh, just talk. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like uh, it, what y'all are talking about in terms of jobs, and I guess like a video reference a little bit. It's like it's honestly, I mean that's a that's a symptom I think of like a, a much larger problem in how I guess like uh, companies they can really just like hold like regions like hostage, like with this like idea of like jobs, like that uh, you can just. Like you can, like a corporation can just be like, yo, we're gonna bring some jobs. <laughs> and, and then like everyone's like, oh, oh. And then like, yeah, you, want, like you want a few like kids. million tax breaks, like jobs. chill. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, like what, like what does that even mean? It's like, um, I guess just to go back to like the reference again, since it's like really in my mind, but like Amazon, like they were talking about, all right, we're gonna bring jobs. <laughs> and it's like New York State doesn't have like a job problem. Like people are pretty like they're like it has well, the city as a whole has like relatively high employment um, compared to I guess like most cities of its scale of its size. Like what it has is like a housing problem, like a serious <laughs> housing problem, a transportation problem. A um, mm -hmm. like it has so many issues that go beyond jobs, and it's like even in terms of I guess like who are these jobs going to? Um, <laughs> I guess, like, what do these jobs entail? Do these jobs mean that people have, I guess, like, a living wage? Like, do they get health care? Do they get things that they need to survive, to, I uh, mean, not just survive, but to, like, actually, you know, enjoy the quality of their life? And, um, yeah, like, it, it's just, like, I, I, I get really, I guess, uh, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, it's really, I guess, like, frustrating when, I guess, like, a lot of, I guess like a lot of debates or I guess like a lot of discourse when it comes to I guess like <clears throat> oh this company or like oh this like really harmful practice it's gonna like bring jobs but like what does that actually mean or what like what does that actually entail for like the people or, like the workers of that region. Mm -hmm. Yeah because jobs is like a sacred word mm -hmm. to the corporations they say the word jobs and that's like a code word that means the, the floodgates open to the city, the special gates, the protective gates, all of a sudden everything opens, like they said, the magic word, so they can enter. And politicians worship it, you know, if they, they don't, do. then the people are like, why, why didn't you support this mm -hmm. move that will create jobs? Mm -hmm. That's also part of the problem. Right, so we have to now move the narrative to what kind of jobs? What kind of jobs do you want? Do you want humane jobs? Do you want risk-free or healthy jobs, what do you actually want? What do the people want? And that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Just uh, not any jobs. And same thing with, uh, I, 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 yeah, I think it all ties into an overall um, idea of like production, like idealizing production as something that's valuable in itself, um, where, whereas, rather than something that's good because maybe it feeds people or gives people something that improves their lives, but something that's like, just because it's a greater number, it's better. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the real key difference, between, key difference between bioregional and biospheric visions, or uh, 
that like key difference in like the quantitative versus qualitative approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and going back to history, the history of development, I don't think that is a, personally I don't think that's an approach that, the qualitative approach is something that can fit within the, the word development. I think the word development itself um, uh, implies like the destruction. Uh, and there's a quote for this that we're gonna end the workshop with. Um, would anyone like to read this quote again from Chief like Oren Leons is from the Onondaga, the group that was living here in Binghamton uh, before Binghamton was a thing. And they're in upstate New York, aren't they somewhere? They have reservations? Um, yeah. Onondaga? Anyone? Yeah? We all must consciously and continuously challenge every model, every program, and every process that the West tries to force upon us. The people who are living on this planet need to break with the narrow concept of human liberation and begin to see liberation as something that needs to be extended to the whole of the natural world. What is needed is the liberation of all things that support life, the air, the water, the trees, all the things which support the sacred web of life. This spiritual consciousness is the highest form of political consciousness. Definitely. So that's, that's the change that I think we need to make in terms of yeah. how we understand development. Yeah, that sums it up perfectly. Can I add just one more thing? Um, just like in addition, I think it's crazy how we like we're so conditioned to think that corporations are like people, and the government has mm -hmm. no like at, like compared to other places, like they have no internet, they don't intervene or anything. And so I think it's crazy how all of us like we keep talking about corporations, like they can do this, they can do all these things, and like it doesn't. I mean, the way it is now, like, that's clearly true, but I just, like, like, there are other places that have found a change where, like, corporations aren't seen as people, and they actually have, like, regulations on them, but I think America has such a huge value on, like, freedom and, like, freedom for the people, but then it kind of gets mixed up between, like, oh, who are these people? Are they the people that, like, really, really benefit from corporations or the actual people that, like, live in this country, so yeah. mm. which is something that I've been thinking about. And to an even greater degree, and like a, another way to think about like the role corporations have in American politics is that like corporations, yes, are treated as people, but it's not just that the government isn't regulating them or like isn't touching them. It, it's a combination of like many factors, primarily being that the government lets them do these things. Like, Ideally, our government would be able to say no when it wants to, but because of the way we our political system works, in which like donations are allowed and like super PACs and funding, like the it's not like we live in like a purely laissez-faire capitalist system, like total free market, no rules. Like it's in fact that the government is allowing these things and shaping a system in which governments. I mean, in which corporations can take advantage of communities and are allowed to get away with this stuff. And so the externalities that are put onto people um, are much, much worse and the corporations don't have to take responsibility for them. And it's under this guise that what the corporations are doing is often better for the consumer. Um, but I don't think it looks at like consumers as also workers and also laborers and people who have their own health and quality of life and ethics in mind. I think Ralph Nader calls it cow cowboy capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. We don't have cap. We don't have a pure system of capitalism. Mm -hmm. We have cowboy capitalism. We I don't have, have a number for this, but there's also so many politicians that invest in things like oil. So that mm -hmm. kind of makes you think, like, where are their values if, you know, mm -hmm. obviously they're going to protect what they're investing in, mm -hmm. even if it's something that's good for the people I want. So. so I think getting involved on a local level is really like the place to begin with this, like just so that this doesn't end on a um, really dark note of like mm -hmm. we can't do anything because that's not really true. Mm -hmm. and. Get, getting involved. There are really awesome organizations in the Binghamton and Broome County area. Um, and being like 
in place, like putting your body where your mouth is, going to city councils, and whether it be us as students while we're here for this temporary time, or wherever we go on in the future, I think it's really important. Not everyone at this university is going to do like a social justice, social action, betterment of the world type job, but um, for those of us who can educate and do want to do that outreach, like it's not like we're alone and it's not like we're ants. We are like real people who have real voices and <laughs> real potential to make a change. And I think, real. huh? Yeah, yeah, as real as it gets. So um, it, what we do does really matter. It does. There was when IBM tried to cut down uh, 200 or 300 of the oldest trees in the Glen in Endwell, the IBM, it's called the IBM Glen, it's a nature preserve of, of sorts. Um, a group of uh, activists went down to New York City where the chairman of IBM was speaking at the Javis, Jacob Javits Center. And <clears throat> when he started speaking, well, first of all, they passed out flyers in the lobby before the event took place. But then when he started speaking, they went in and they sat in the fourth row, and with every with every word that he spoke, every other word, one of the four would interrupt him until they were escorted out. That's the kind of activism that we need. We need it needs to be visible and directed. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't even talking about environmentalism or anything. He was talking about something else having to do with IBM. Mm -hmm. But they showed up there. They drove down from upstate New York. I think most of the, most of the four, and they went there and they did what needed to be done, mm -hmm. and that caused him to realize what was going on. He didn't even know what was going on. He was never told. Mm -hmm. It's also about calling for more transparency with whatever we see going on, and um, I think in general, I mean, at least people who have access to information. I mean, it's the internet age, so it is a little easier, but still not everyone, like, in terms of, like, national and, like, state elections, like, we can call for more transparency from our representatives as well um, in terms of who's who they're getting donations from. Like, that is public information. So there are ways to really do that. I mean, like, this past um, state election season, like, Claudia Tenney isn't around anymore. Like, am I wrong? No, like that's that was a that was a big movement on the part of people here, and so um, it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. And there is also the question of like to what extent is working within the system, like like how effective is that versus um, yeah. just like grassroots organizing and there's so that's that's all for this workshop. Thank uh, you. We have to set up for the we have to set up and review stuff for the next one. If people who came late, you guys please come back. <laughs> um, you guys, you also just chill here. Anyone who wants to hang out, you guys.